On your name tags, it asks you what keeps you grounded, which is really easy for me, because I'm a parent. Um, and my son has no problem telling me that I'm lame and old. But um, <laughs> my favorite quote on that was from Dave Grohl. You guys know Dave Grohl. He's the front man of the Foo Fighters and from Nirvana. And somebody asked him at some point how he stays grounded. And he said, I have kids. They think I'm an asshole. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Should you, you know, ever need a reality check, spend a day with a kid. Um, a reality check is the perfect talk for me because I'm a journalist and I, I, I feel like that's what I do every single day is try to keep people grounded in what's really actually happening rather than what you think is happening. Um, so I want to start out by explaining to you why you're probably not going to remember almost anything that I'm about to say, scientifically. <laughs> so scientists have actually done a ton of research on our retention and our memories. And they found that when they brought people in, and this is cross-cultural, this is no matter what country you're in, it's mostly developed countries that they're doing most of this research, but it doesn't matter what language you speak. So if they sit people down and say, okay, I want you to listen to a five to 10 minute talk, and then we're gonna ask you questions about it, so pay close attention. When they get done, people only remember, immediately after, about 50% of what they heard. 48 hours later, they've lost another 20%, 20 and about a month later, they only remember 20 to 25%. So if you think about this, a lot of businesses often have annual meetings. Totally useless. <laughs> useless. That's your first reality check of the day. And the other one is, is that taking notes on a digital device actually doesn't help you with your memory. Um, it doesn't stimulate the part of your memory that helps you remember. If they do a brain scan, that part of your brain does not light up. The only thing that lights up if you're trying to remember is if you're actually writing. You need the manual. Yeah, there. See, Tim's got it. <laughs> you need that manual physiological action in order to stimulate the part of your brain that uh, helps you remember. I have a stack of papers, that's because I'm about to overload you with scientific statistics. Remember how we all love statistics? And there's a reason why I'm doing that. I'm gonna talk to you about good conversations, and believe me, statistics are not the way to have a good conversation. And if you don't believe that, then go home and try to win an argument with your spouse or partner by throwing statistics at them <laughs> and see where that gets you. Um, but the reason I'm about to tell you a lot of statistics is because you're already most likely set up not to believe what I'm about to tell you. The fact of the matter is, is that most of us, even if we don't admit it, we all think we're pretty good talkers when we talk. We don't always like to talk, but we all kind of think we're pretty good at it when we do it and that we're pretty good listeners. But we're really not. Um, so I'm about to tell you why <laughs> and how we know that. Um, and keep an open mind, because this is how you're gonna actually learn to be better talkers. So I gave this, a reality check for me, I know you're not ever supposed to read the comments, but I gave a TED talk, and um, one of the comments I loved, um, and I assume it's a, 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 English was their second language, because I fixed some of the grammar, but they said, Celeste, humanity has waited 20,000 years to listen to you telling them how to have conversations. I couldn't be more thrilled with you handing down to humanity the 10 rules of engaging conversations. <laughs> And you know what? Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I am probably not the one that humanity has waited for. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know when you spend a, a when, when you have a job and you do that same thing every single day, day after day, and you do it for years, for me it's been almost 20 years, you get to be pretty good at that one thing. 
And the one thing that I have been doing for almost 20 years now is having conversations. And I have conversations with presidents and with movie stars and kindergarten teachers and truck drivers and KKK members and billionaires. Um, I have conversations with people that I really like. I have pe conversations with people that I loathe on a visceral basis. I have conversations with people that I agree with. I have conversations with people that I could not disagree with more. But you know what? I always have a really good conversation, always. It's possible. Now the problem that's happening right now is we used to say that there's a couple subjects you stay away from when you're trying to be polite and have a good conversation, right? Politics and religion. The problem now is that everything is politics and religion. That's the problem. You can't steer away from those subjects because they're everything. You can't talk about your health. What did Henry Higgins say, you're, stick to the weather and your health? The weather, really? You're gonna talk about climate change and that's not gonna lead to an argument? <laughs> And your health, seriously, because anti-vaxxing is a thing. So that's the problem now. And, and so you can't avoid those conversations. The thing is, is that you have to learn how to have those conversations anyway, with respect for the other person. We are more polarized now than we ever have been since the Civil War. And think back for just a moment, because that means the Vietnam War, the Cold War era, we are more polarized. We are more likely dis to disagree with one another now than we were during the Red Scare. Okay? That's something to think about. The last time we were this polarized, the last time we disagree with each other this much, we were killing each other, literally. Um, also, we have learned that at least 20% of Americans would be really unhappy and possibly angry if someone from the opposite political party joined their family. And a third of us say that at all of our friends agree with us politically. Now think about that for just a second. <laughs> number one, you're probably wrong. But number two, it means you're actually choosing your friends according to who agrees with you. Reality check. Okay, so uh, here's another thing that we all think, which is that we communicate a lot, and we do. There's a, a, a woman named Sherry Turkle who does some of the best research in um, the, the effects of technology on relationships. Um, and she talks about connection versus communication. Because we're not actually communicating, we're connecting. We tweet, we Instagram, we Snapchat, we Tumblr, we Facebook, we do a ton of stuff. We're talking all the time. But we're not actually communicating with anybody. Face-to-face -face and even voice-to-voice -voice conversation is completely disappearing. I want you to stop for just a moment and think about how many times you had the choice between calling somebody at work or emailing and you just emailed, right? Who here would rather send an email than call on the phone? Okay, so, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. There are a couple really compelling reasons why it's important to get back to regular communication. Um, the first is a business reason. We lose $37 billion a year because of bad communication. And that's just, that's $26,000 per worker per year. And that's just if you survey the large corporations, it doesn't include the smaller businesses. So you do the math, I know it's early how much that would go higher if we did include them. The other thing is that good communication is actually really profitable. If you have a leader who's a good communicator, you have a 50% higher rate of returns than those whose leader is a bad communicator. But here's the reality check part of it. We do know that people report they'd rather do business with someone that they trust and that they like and that they can talk to. Total no-brainer, but get this part of it people would still rather do business with the person that they like, even if they know that the product is inferior and the price is higher. They'll still choose the person they can talk to. It puts a little bit of different context on the election of George W. Bush, because so many people talked about how they wanted to have a beer with him. That's how important that is to us as humans. Now, I'm using a lot of American statistics, but believe me, this is the whole developed world, and I assume that if we did great research in, in most parts of Asia, or South America, or Africa, or some of the developing countries, we'd find really similar results. It's just that they're not as affected by technology as we did. The, the use of technology has just exploded. And the research on what that does to our brains 
is really lagging. We're only now beginning to figure out what it means to be sending this many texts and this many emails and not be speaking face to face. Young people, I'm not even talking millennials, I'm talking the next generation, which I don't even know what name we're on yet. Um, they are more likely to send texts and they send hundreds of texts per day than to speak to somebody face to face in a day's time. Which means they can go days without talking to someone on the phone or face to face. Okay, the other, the other reason why communication is really important is actually just a human one. Um, the University of Michigan compiled 72 different studies from all over the place. And this was really recent. This was, I think, maybe three years ago that they did this. And what they found is that empathy among human beings, among college students, has decreased by 40%, the ability to empathize with another person. And almost all of that decrease has happened since the year 2000. What happened in the year 2000? Hmm. Most people got a smartphone. Now, if there's any scientists here, I'm not saying it's causation. I'm saying it's correlation. And we have to start figuring out what the correlation is and whether there is causation there. Because you don't have to not use technology. Technology is awesome. My iPad, smartphone, Samsung watch, <laughs> laptop, if I did not have those, I would not be on time to anything ever. <laughs> and I would never pay my bills. But. Um, <laughs> But again, we don't actually, we're just beginning to touch the surface of how that affects us as human beings. Let me tell you about a study that they did in Britain, because this is like, for me, mind blown. Okay, so they studied pairs of people, they brought strangers in and had them talk to each other in a room. And they did this over and over and over and mixed up the pairs, they did it for month after month after month. And they discovered that when they brought in a cell phone and they just set it on a table in the room, even if it belonged to neither of the people talking. Those two people came out of that conversation and both, they were 65% more likely to report that the other person was untrustworthy, not empathetic, and unlikable. Just with a cell phone somewhere in the room that didn't belong to them. Now, how many of you, when you go to lunch with a friend, leave your cell phone on the table? Come on, you know you do. You take it out of your pocket and you set it on the table. Stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> put it away, because none of those people were conscious that that was the effect that was happening inside their brain, but it is. Um, so here's another one, and it gets to the point of, of why we don't listen, because I'm going to talk about listening quite a bit in a moment. Um, you may have seen this because it made big headlines. Harvard recently completed a study, and when I say recent, I think that it ended in like 2013, um, in which they discovered that talking about yourself stimulates the same pleasure centers in your brain as sex, heroin, and cocaine. <laughs> so you know those lab rat tests where they show the labs, and the, the rats, and they like get a pleasurable sensation, and so they're sitting there at their bed and going. <laughs> so. We're doing that. We're talking about ourselves all the time and it's hitting a pleasurable center. Now, why is that a reality check? It's because you're gonna leave a conversation and you're gonna feel awesome about it. <laughs> but the other person that was in that conversation with you is like, what the actual F? That person never stopped talking about themselves but you feel like you just took a huge snort of cocaine. You're like, man. <laughs> and this also occurs in job interviews. We've discovered that people who are interviewing applicants sometimes spend more than half the time talking about themselves. And look, it helps the applicant because the, per the, the, the person walks away from the interview going, <laughs> Dang, I feel great. But the applicant's sitting there going, and if you're competing for the best talent, probably not the best way to do that. But it's the same thing the other way. If you're applying for a job and you, you feel like you did great, and then later you didn't get the job and you wonder why, that may be why. Because there's a huge difference between the perception and the reality of how that conversation went. Um, in my TED talk, I, I, I give 10 specific ways to improve your conversation. I'm not gonna give them all because 
the TED Talk is out there and you can watch it anytime. But you know, Sherry Turkle, who I mentioned earlier, she talks about how to have more conversations. Um, this is something that's so important. Have you guys, you guys all know Chick-fil-A, right? Um, so Chick-fil-A has actually has this new thing going where they put a bucket on your table in their restaurants. And if you throw your cell phone in there and you don't touch it for the whole meal, they'll give you a free ice cream. And I want you again, I'm gonna ask you to do the math here real quick. Because Chick-fil-A is an extremely profitable corporation. They have 2,000 locations worldwide. And every one of those ice creams costs $1.25. So multiply that by the number of families that come in and every person at that table gets a $1.25 ice cream. Someone at the corporation of Chick-fil-A, and I'm, you know, I'm not a Chick-fil-A person, I'm just saying that some corporate person said, this is how much bad conversation is hurting us, not just as people, but as a business as well. So we're ready to invest tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, just to get people to talk to one another across the table. So, I'm not gonna go over the 10 steps, but I do wanna talk about a couple things that you can change almost immediately. The first one is start noticing how much you talk about yourself. I'm not saying stop doing it, because that's impossible. I'm just saying start taking note as you're talking. Because one thing that they have discovered is that we talk about ourselves at least 60% of the time. Maybe 60% doesn't sound like a huge amount to you, but you have to remember that that 40% is everything else, your car, your job, your dog, the other person standing in front of you. Everything else in the world is in the 40%, and the 60% is you and how you're feeling. Just something to take note of, because it, it turns people off. And the, the one step that I especially wanted to focus on, besides listening, is I talk about not equating your experience with other people's. And this is the number one thing that I get pushback on. People have a really rough time with this. And what I mean by this is that somebody will be saying, oh, I lost my dad. My dad died over the weekend. And they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I lost my dad two years ago, and that was really rough. You know, he died of cancer. Now, I'm no psychologist. <laughs> I think that most of us do that out of really good intentions. I do. I think most of us think that that's showing empathy, that it's showing that you have a similar shared experience, and that you're trying to bond, but that's not how it works. 999 times out of 1,000, that is not how it works for the other person. Why? Because your experience is not the same as theirs. Losing your dad is not the same as them losing their dad. They are a completely different person in a completely different place in life, and number two, you're just drawing focus onto yourself. This person who's struggling now has to say to you, oh, I'm so sorry. Why would, why would you want them to be forced to, sh to reach out to you when they've just reached out to you with pain? And I totally get that it's almost always well-intentioned, but you're actually demanding something of them instead of giving to them in that moment. The best possible thing you can do is ask them how it is. How is it? I don't, I can't, you know, I, that must be really painful. Is there anything I can do? I mean, I, I, there's no words I can say. Because believe me, if you've read any of the topics on here's what not to say when someone dies of cancer, here's what not to say when they lose their job, blah, 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 right? You've all seen these posted. Here's what not to say. No, you can't say anything. Re, you, nothing is the right thing except tell me. They've reached out to you and they've told you that they lost someone, so let them tell you. That's what that moment is for. And I know it's really tough. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons why people have so much, such a hard time letting go of this is for what I alluded to earlier, because telling that story about yourself is not only cathartic, but you're yet again slamming your finger on that button of cocaine and sex. <laughs> It, it feels really good to you, but it doesn't feel really good to the other person. The other thing, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on time, don't you worry, Blake. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to focus on is listening. And again, this is something when we self-report, most people, if it's anonymous, because we tr a lot of people try to be, to be modest, 
But if it's anonymous, most people report that they're a good listener. And most of us are not. This, none of the things that I talk about when I talk about communication are things that I don't do still currently. The reason I'm an expert on this is because I've done and still do all these things on a daily basis in my professional and home life. <laughs> um, we, all, we all do it and we all have to get better. And the problem is that technology is making it harder and harder for us. So we're avoiding conversations that we don't wanna have. And here's a really interesting thing, and this is especially about listening. Apologies, who likes to apologize in here? Does anybody enjoy that? Two people love to apologize. Um, awesome. So here's the thing. When you send an email or a text, they can actually track um, the physiological and brain and neural changes when someone receives an apology by text or email. And I want you just to close your eyes for a moment and imagine that someone has done something really mean. Just remember the last time somebody did something awful to you. And imagine receiving that text. I'm really sorry. Now, notice any feeling changes in your body. Notice how you feel. Okay. Now, I want you all to look at me. And I'm going to tell you, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm sorry I did that. Is there a difference in the way that feels? It's not just perceived. In fact, the written apology does almost nothing. It lights up nothing. It's as though you didn't say it. And it's part of the reason you can't ever move on from that. Whereas the spoken apology, even if it's by phone, lights up the compassion center of the brain. Why? Because apologies are rough. And that's the point. They're painful. And the point is for us to hear that the person is struggling. And hearing them struggle with that apology actually goes, bing, compassion for this other human being. And then they're much more likely to forgive you. And then you can move on. If I can tell you nothing else besides putting your phone away when you're at lunch with somebody else, or anywhere else, a meeting especially, it's pick up the phone. Pick up the phone and call people, especially if it's a tough conversation. Because I know your technology is gonna allow you to avoid that tough conversation, but do you, remember I said that we talk about ourselves 60% of the time? It goes up to 80% on social media. And the reason why we like social media so much is because we can edit ourselves. If, it, if we screwed up, we can delete it. We can add photos for flavor. <laughs> we can add links to support our point. We can edit and delete and make it better. Conversations, not possible. They are messy and they're demanding and they require attention and it's not easy and they're not gonna go as planned and you're gonna say the wrong thing and that is the whole point. Because as we have learned, it is in fact the face-to-face -face conversations that teach young people how to self-reflect. That's where you learn how to think and reason. And if we lose that, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. And that's your final reality check. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, that was awesome. Thanks. We're gonna do a Q&A. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll run the microphone to you and uh, ask away. If I can ever make it to you. Hi, Celeste. Hi. I just want to say thank you for your talk, and I wanted to ask, what's the toughest conversation you've ever had? Uh, besides asking my husband for a divorce, um, I'm going to assume you mean professionally, because otherwise, that's nowhere to go. Um, 
I, the toughest conversation I've ever had was a conversation I had with the CEO of the Christian Radio Network, and he was supporting a bill in Michigan to restrict access to uh, birth control abortions. And at one point, he said to me, um, you know, sex is really volatile. It has to have controls. I mean, you're a really attractive woman. What if I wanted to have sex with you right now and you didn't want to? That would be rape. <laughs> and I was like, well, thank you very much. You have a good day and interview done. <laughs> Um, there are conversations, as much as I love conversations, there are conversations that do not need to continue. <laughs> that was one of them. Next question. How you doing, Celeste? Um, Good. I don't know if you remember me. My name is Bame Joyner. Uh, I work at the Center for Civic Innovation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you got a chance to, like, interview me. Yes. And, um, <laughs> How was that? So I, I, I would like to ask you a question. I, I didn't get a chance to ask you. It was your show, so I, I you know. Um, but uh, it, our show was about the 2.5 million more people yep. moving to Atlanta. So I wanted and now to we're know. Not, you are not prepared. That was kind of the thrust of everything you said. For real, yeah, yeah. for real, yo. <laughs> yo, you're dope. Um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to know, like, what do you think about, uh, what, what impact do you think Atlanta's creative class will have uh, on, the, on the new Atlanta, on the future of Atlanta and where Atlanta's going? It depends on how, how good that creative class is in assuming that you have something to learn. The, the, when, when growth is shut off, it's because we assume we're smarter than the other people. Um, and look, there are stupid people in the world, absolutely. Um, but they're an expert in something. They know something better than you do. There is something they know in which they are a master. Um, and so you have to enter every conversation that you have assuming you have something to learn. Bill Nye says that all the time. Everyone you will ever meet knows something that you don't. And the problem with creative people, which often means smart people, the smarter that you are, the more likely you are to enter conversations getting ready to pass on what you know, um, and it's up in the air. We just have to see how willing we are to learn from people that we don't agree with. Isha Edwards, I'm a brand marketing manager for Epic Measures. This was extremely therapeutic for me in part because I stress the very things that you stress about communication. Um, Bless as, you. <laughs> as a marketer, particularly as it relates to customer service. So as the digital divide drives marketers to do more things um, virtually, who is actually responsible for talking about that reality check, about one-on-one -on -one engagement, talking to customers and individuals and learning from people versus data? Um, you are, and all of you. Um, I don't think it's any one person's responsibility. You know, the best, I don't mean to get all Eastern and mystic on you, but the, the best mentor is the person who's not saying a word and just living the way they think is right. Um, I mean, Buddha always said, if your mouth is open, you're not learning. Um, I'm paraphrasing that. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I do a lot of public speaking engagements. Um, for this very reason. Um, and I, I always try to warn them that this is great. You might leave this feeling inspired. You might leave this talk feeling like, okay, I'm going to change. This is going to be great. I'm going to have awesome conversations. But you're most likely not going to retain it until you put it in practice. So you have to choose one way to get better at one thing. That's it. So who's responsible for that? Everybody. Pick something, pick, pick a thing to get better at. And then you know what, go to a person saying, you know what, I'm trying to get better at not talking about myself. So if I start talking about myself, say ding. I, in my own staff, I tell them, if I get off topic, because I have adult ADD, no joke, and I will start talking about completely wild things. I say, if I get off track, just raise your hand and remind me. And that's one of the best ways, because then that person goes, oh, I do that all the time. Somebody interrupts you all the time, say, hey, you know what, I can't even think. You're interrupting me all the time. I'm really sorry. My brain can't handle it. Can you, for my sake, can you let me finish a sentence? Yeah. Yes. 
You can say it to me and then I'll repeat it. Good morning. Uh huh. We're not there yet. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. It's okay. Um, I have been torturing my son with face-to-face -face long in-depth conversations for his whole life. Um, and so I don't think he does have a different view on that. I mean, when he, he likes to play games and he does play plenty of video games, but he's also really into the face-to-face -face Dungeons and Dragons and Hero Clicks and where he sits down at a table with 12 other people and they fight it out. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think technology means less human. It, it, not necessarily. The problem is, is that we all are uncomfortable by human interaction. We're, it makes us uncomfortable. And that's actually the point. That's how we grow. So if we allow technology to take that away, if all, every time, instead of going into the bank, you're always banking only through the ATM and the online portal, which is me, again, we're talking about me, then, then it becomes problematic. But this is a moment, we have a moment right now when we're just beginning to get some of this realization in on what technology is doing to us and our brains and ourselves as human beings. And we also can see what's disastrously happening in Washington DC and ask ourselves if there are connections, if there, it goes beyond correlation and into causation at any point. So this is our moment to, to pull these threads together and say, look, we can change the course of history and remain human. Look, I, I'm going to tell you another amazing thing. Along the evolutionary path, when we broke away from chimps and apes, um, we evolved specifically to be able to speak and be able to speak very clearly. And evolutionarily, it was so important that our vocal tract changed, our voice box moved further and further down our throat to make speech possible, but it also made it possible for us to choke to death. That's how important speech is to us in the evolutionary scale. Apes don't choke to death because they didn't evolve that way. But human beings needed to be able to communicate with one another. And we were willing to die for it let that roll around in your brain for a minute. <laughs> you got one more question over here. So thought provoking, Celeste, thank you very much. Thanks. You mentioned the uh, group without a name, but school kids. Yes. Um, and Do they your... have a name? <laughs> do 18, school... do we'll call them else? school kids for now. Okay. Um, your concerns are, are really valid, I think, um, and I'm curious to know who, uh, as a parent or as a professional, you've had conversation with in the uh, Georgia public education sphere about this concern and what, what if anything, is, is being done to address it? Nobody. No one. I hope that'll be, I hope that'll be one of your shows soon. <laughs> So there you go. That was an easy one. <laughs> We've got time for one more. One more. <laughs> I, I promise this lady she would get to ask. Here you go. Hi, Celeste. Hi. Um, this, that was an amazing talk, and oh, I think thanks. the reality check for a lot of us. And it's, I think, in the work of um, in trying to build empathy in our city uh, to help understand some tough conversations that are going to need to be had, for especially the upcoming election regarding race, regarding transportation and transit and all the issues that matter to us. Um, I want to ask you a question about media, media? and the role me? media has played. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I mean, I think a lot of, um, you've got the political sphere of things. There's a lot of um, conversations going on about how our source of media impacts our perspective 
um, on a lot of different issues. So it could be whether it's whether it's like people who watch Fox News have a very different perspective and therefore a very different point of view and only hang out with people who agree with that point of view. So what role of just media in general has helped prolong this lack of empathy, if anything? Um, we have the media that we want right now. I know it's really, um, it feels good to be able to blame some kind of uh, faceless older white guy somewhere running Fox News or MSNBC who's ruining the world, but this is the media we all wanted. We wanted to hear the opinions that we agreed with. We wanted someone to give us an answer. You know what one of the final, one of the biggest complaints about NPR is that we, we ask questions and we don't answer them. We, we like people to tell us the answer and we like that answer to agree with what we already believe. So what role does media play? It ro plays the role that we chose for it. It's really profitable for both Fox News and MSNBC or anybody else to, to tell us what, to tell the people that agree with them what they want to hear. Um, I mean, I could go back and blame Bill Clinton because he's the one that first made in, uh, news a, a profit-generating industry rather than a public service. Happy to do that anytime, hopefully over a beer because it makes me unhappy. <laughs> Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that there's plenty of sources out there. Do not tell me there's no sources that don't give you both sides of the story because I work for one of them and I have for almost 20 years. Frankly, I could have made a gigantic amount of money not doing that. If I wanted to report on the weather and crime and celebrity, I absolutely could have made a good amount of money. I, I, be, I work for public radio because I believe in it. Because I know personally, from a personal experience, that no one is directing my editorial choices. They're fact-checking me which I don't know if it happens everywhere. Um, they fact check me all the time, but they don't tell me I can't report on something for any reason. So there are sources out there for finding good journalism. Mother Jones, that magazine does incredible investigative journalism, and whether you agree with their point of view or not, it's all fact-based. Frankly, um, American Conservative, fantastic magazine. Great reporting, very balanced, fact-based. You can, you can find it. Choose the media that you want. And don't, talk, don't complain. If you don't hate Fox News, don't complain about it. It's just more me free media for them. Just focus on the things that you like. Read what you like. Educate yourself. And then be willing to talk to people that don't agree with you. Because you know what? They might be right. They might be right. <laughs> so that, was, that was our last question. Oh. Let's give Celeste a round of applause. <laughs>